Let's begin this morning with these words from God's Word. Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 18. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, looking at him with sadness, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife, or brothers, or parents, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. We've been following Jesus in Luke's gospel since he left his ministry home base up in Galilee and set his face toward Jerusalem, Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Since then, he's been on the move toward the holy city. We call it the holy city not because of, of any particular thing about it, but it was the place where he would do what he came to do when he arrived there. That is, give his life on the cross, for all mankind, and then be raised from the tomb three days later. So we have heard and seen all kinds of things on this road with Jesus. We've seen miracles, we've heard incredible teachings, debates and discussions, and many, many interactions with people, three of which remain before we wrap up our study as the Lord comes to the gates of the city of David. Here in our passage for today, Jesus interacts with a wealthy ruler. Following that, he's going to come across a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. And then he will cross paths with a big little man named Zacchaeus. But first, this rich man. Luke tells us that he was some type of ruler, an elite, we might call him. The other gospel writers confirm that he was rich, and one of them tells us that he was young. Rich, young, elite. In fact, Luke emphasizes in verse 23 that he was extremely wealthy. He wasn't just a little bit rich, he was extremely rich, highly successful. We might think of, of one of the famous social media influencers of recent years, you know, very smart, quick, fabulously rich, uh, good with people, that kind of thing. So he comes to Jesus and he addresses him in a way that no one ever addressed anyone in that culture. In Jewish culture, you never called a human teacher good teacher, ever. Only God was ever addressed as good. And Jesus, of course, points that out to the, 
to the young man, doesn't he, in his response? So we might wonder, what's this rich guy trying to do? Is he trying to flatter Jesus? Oh, possibly. And some think, think that that's what he's doing, but I think there's more going on because Jesus really seems to believe that there is a level of true sincerity in this man. He, he's not there like so many have been that we've noticed that, you know, being fake, trying to uh, trip Jesus up with a question or something like that. I think instead, uh, this, this young man is truly impressed with Jesus. He sees something in Jesus that draws him to him. He is earnest with his question. Again, the question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So calling Jesus good teacher, it may have included some flattery, but he's probably just doing what a person with good people skills tends to do, that is, offer a meaningful compliment in order to try and draw them closer or influence them in some way. Jesus goes along with it. He has nothing to fear. And, and after all, he knows the rich man's heart. He knows what's going on inside of him. He always does. But... Take special note here that the rich guy shows his lack of understanding right away in his question. Think about it. Um, his question is contradictory. Again, the question is, what must I do to inherit? One doesn't have to do anything to inherit do they? Other than uh, to be born. You're born to inherit. And so the young man is confused to begin with in his question. So Jesus goes on and, and he names commandments, several of the commandments, um, which he already knew full well that, that this young man had obeyed all his life. And, and so uh, the rich guy dutifully testifies, yep. I have done all that. I am, I am not an adulterer. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a thief. I'm honest as the day is long. And I love and respect my parents. I don't drink, smoke, or chew, or run with those who do, right? He's a good guy. Uh, Jesus, of course, already knew that. But he's a good guy person. But here's the thing. Being a good guy wasn't going to get this guy eternal life. Keeping all the commandments wasn't going to get him eternal life. Being rich was useless in that pursuit. Being young didn't mean anything in that. And being an influencer, a, a ruler, did not reserve a spot in heaven for this fella. The fact is, and this may be hard for us to hear as well, there is no good person. There's no good persons. Not really. Now, we can all maybe list reasons we think we're good. We can list certain commands that we indeed obey, and so we feel good about that. Been baptized? Yep, done that. Attend church? Sure thing. Worship in spirit and truth? Got that one down. Makes me good, doesn't it? Gets me to heaven, doesn't it? Well, Jesus says, no one is good except God alone. No one, not this rich guy and not me and all my self-righteousness. 
Folks, if you think about it, who do we have to pass muster with in order to get into heaven? God himself, right? The holy and the righteous God. He's the one who offers citizenship in heaven. He's the one who gives eternal life. Jesus was God in the flesh. He was perfectly holy. He was sinless. He was completely righteous. And so Jesus looks at this young, extremely wealthy ruler. And, and the other gospel writers, Mark in particular, mentions Jesus loved him when he looked at him. And, and of course, he does all of us as well. But Jesus saw where this guy was not right. And he sees into all of us. Sees past all of our banners of righteousness that boast of all the commands we keep. Jesus knew this young man was not even keeping commandment number one. Not even the first what was commandment number one? You shall have no other gods before me. And we might hear that and say, what? This great commandment keeper was an idolater? You better believe it. He most certainly was. Why? How? Because he put someone else, something else, before God. That is the definition of idolatry. Putting someone or something else before God. Now Jesus knew exactly what it was for this rich guy. It was his wealth, his extreme wealth. It could have been something else. It could have been many other things. And it might be many different things for us. I always thought it, it's easy to hear this story of the rich young ruler and think, this doesn't really apply to me so much because Lord knows I'm not rich. Well, I, I won't debate you on that this morning. But I'm pretty sure we could find plenty of people in the world today that would debate you on that point. People without a home. People who are starving. People who are under military assault. Be that as it may, there are many things we can put before God besides our wealth that would put us right in the same boat with this rich guy. We could put our job before God, our career. We could put our family before God. Now, we, we hear that and we say, doesn't the Bible say we need to love our families, take care of our families? Yes, but we can put our family before God, our spouse, our child, we can put many different kinds of interests that we have before God, recreations, sports, leisure pursuits. We could put our politics before God. We could prioritize our personal opinions before God. Oh yes, you see, to each one of us, Jesus looking at us, and loving us might say one thing you lack. And then list whatever it is that we bow down to before we bow down to the God of heaven whom we all want to join one day in that place that he's prepared for us. To this man... Jesus says, one thing you lack, sell all that you have 
and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Now, that doesn't mean that that's exactly what he would say to you or me. Lord doesn't ask every person to divest themselves of all their wealth. That's not every person's idol, you see. Uh, Zacchaeus, who we'll look at here in a week or two, was very wealthy as well. Probably extremely wealthy. But he doesn't have to give up all his riches. He gives up a chunk by his own decision. But he doesn't have to give it all up. Jesus doesn't demand that he do, do that. But this guy does. He, he needs to give it all up. His great wealth was keeping him from following Jesus. From being acceptable in God's sight. And so he needed to get rid of it. He needed to give it all away and go down the road with the Lord. I mean, give, give Jesus a break here. The young guy is the one who asked him the question. He, he's the one who came to him and said, what must I do to go to heaven? Be careful what you ask Jesus because he'll probably give you an answer. He, he knows every crevice of your heart and soul. He knows exactly what's keeping you from being pleasing to God. And he'll tell you. He will. You read and study his word today, he'll tell you. He'll tell you that one thing you lack. You might not even know what it is. Or maybe you do. But many times we don't. I don't think this rich guy knew what it was. Because look at his reaction when Jesus plainly told him. He seems to have been shocked. Into silence. No more questions come from him. And, and he shuts up. And that's pretty much the end of it. Verse 23 says he became very sad. Deeply distressed. Literally, it says he was surrounded by or swamped by sadness. Why? Because the truth was he wasn't about to give up the very thing that defined him. His great wealth. Wasn't going to give that up. Who was this guy? I think there's a reason we don't get his name. Why? Because he was rich guy. Rich young guy. Rich young ruler guy. That's who he was. And to inherit eternal life, he needed to become a Jesus guy. He, he needed to go with Jesus down this road toward Jerusalem and whatever that entailed. And, and Jesus clearly invited him to go. But that would mean that he would have to give up who he was, who he identified as. Rich guy. You know, we hear a lot way too much about identity these days. Who or what people identify as. Uh, I know growing up that um, most men identified themselves with their profession. What they did, whatever it was, you know, fireman, businessman, carpenter, Preacher, a lot of times when men met each other, the first question was, what do you do? They identified themselves by what they did. And, and today people still do that, I guess, but they also identify themselves in other ways, you know, with their, uh, maybe their political persuasion 
or their sexuality, or sometimes even their sports team. This guy in Luke 18 was rich guy. Big rich man in town. He needed to become Jesus' guy. But he wouldn't do it. Wouldn't give up his identity for Jesus's. You see, the only way that we can join God in heaven one day is that when that great last day comes and we stand before the God of heaven, he looks at us and sees the identity of Jesus, his son, stamped upon us. If instead, God looks and he sees rich guy, or he sees liberal, or conservative, or he sees American, or Russian, or you name the identity other than Jesus, then God will know that we belong to someone or something else. And he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. I'd just remind us in closing today of the inspired words of Paul in Galatians chapter 3 where he wrote for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither slave nor free there is neither male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's the identity that will get you eternal life. If that's not yours this morning, we invite you to make a change. Even right now, as we stand and sing.